let me introduce our uh, dean faculty and the professor here professor jasna bapat it's an honor to introduce professor jasna and as many of you know her from her teaching and research and administration but some of the students may not be knowing that she joined as a faculty member at IIIT Bangalore since 2005 she received her phd from penn state university in the area of wireless communication after graduation she worked on design and implementation of wired and wireless communication systems at bell labs home dell in new jersey she also held faculty position in fairling dickinson university in new jersey her current areas of interest include internet of things smart buildings spectral efficiency improvement in 5g and sdn she teaches undergraduate as well as <coughs> graduate courses in analog digital communication and iot and so on the uh, if she is too modest and because i know she doesn't speak about herself she what she does let me talk about couple of things uh, she is doing as silently she works so uh, some of you may have seen her only teaching along with her administrative load but as a principal investigator and a co investigator within the last 5 years as she has brought in 3 crores 74 lakhs 84000 rupees as a projects different projects as a pi and co pi another project big project in the verge of sanction so in already in the final stage i have not considered that she has more than 6 paper in the top journals within last 2 years and i typically communications letters i typically wireless communications i typically transactions and i will save us <coughs> and she has multiple numbers of papers in the conferences which are all are peer reviewed and professor josna is the co-founder of networking and communication research lab which we, she always tries to bring in systems level understanding along with her teaching which is extremely important for most of times for an engineering students because for engineering student theory is important no doubt in it along with that bring in system understanding how it works and how it is related to the projects and all kind of things and today's talks is already written at here this is a more mostly on 5g in the direction of that how to adopt more number of iot devices given a cell uh area and how to increase the all kind of communications better parameters with respect to that i request professor josna bapat to present his her talk thank you professor das for the kind words uh so today's my talk is coverage enhancement for machine type communication i was told to stay within this zone which is a bit strange for me but i'll give it a try so this is the work that i am presenting uh, is the work that i have worked with one of my phd students who was that time uh, ms by research student parthiban along with professor das so the three work is are kind of related what i'll be uh, talking about is the first paper which talks about the coverage enhancement for this mtc device as i have to do in most my presentations i need to explain the title first so i'll do that i'm talking about coverage enhancement as well as for machine type communication so first what i'll do is talk a little about what is machine type uh, communication why is it relevant why am i talking about it in this context and specifically everybody knows we are talking about we are way past 4g or lte now so what is its relevance in 5g where is this work going and why do we need to enhance the coverage for whatever this machine type communication ends up being and as it turns out whenever we talk about coverage enhancement that has to do with something called the signal to noise ratio all of us are familiar with those lines on our mobile phones where those lines are going down we say the signal strength is going down it's not the signal strength that matters per se it is how strong the signal is with respect to noise so how do we improve the noise and the technique that is used for that is what is called the channel coding generally when channel coding is used it means some sort of repetition or wastage of bandwidth what we have done in our work is use some of the information which is already available in the system 
to improve the SNR, which in turn improves the coverage for these machine for machine type communication. So I'll go in each one of these topics briefly. So what is machine type communication? There are it goes by different names. People have also talked about it as M to M or machine to machine communication. Some people also refer to it as D to D or device to device communication. They are about the same. So machine to machine communication is a form of data communication that involves one or more entities that do not necessarily require human interaction or intervention for the process of communication. So machine type communication was the phrase that was uh, coined by 3GPP which is a standardizing body for all the communication systems. Where does machine to machine communication come into picture? You are talking about security. There are surveillance. If somebody has opened the door, those sensors are supposed to send the information to a gateway. From there, the information or the message is supposed to go to the either to the police or the security system. No human intervention is required in that. Tracking or tracing. When you are talking about fleet management, whether you are tracking your packages sent by blue tart or you are looking at where some of the uh, your vehicles are moving, whether it is petrol or anything else which may be important. Traffic information, toll booth operation, some of the even traffic optimization. Looking at how the traffic is, the traffic might be measured and based on that, the way the traffic is directed could be changed without a human having to interfere. The payments as well as some of the health monitoring things, remote control, uh, maintenance, as well as some of the metering devices. For example, there is no need for somebody to go and take the measurements. Instead, the meters will send the readings directly at a periodic interval to the certain devices. So these are examples of some of the machine type communication. I have taken different aspects. As you can see, something like metering, where the readings may be sent every day or sometimes even every week. Versus when you talk about traffic optimization, the readings are sent far more often and the delay in that is far more important than what would happen with say a metering application. So what we have been doing so far is what we call now the human type communication. So how does the machine type communication differ from human type communication? Well one answer is it is different. In what way? Remember, when we are talking about human type communication, there are so many people that may be present within a certain set. At a time, only about 15 to 20 humans are supposed to be active. Although you are connected to the network, you are not active. Not more than 15 to 20 can be active at the same time. And there are a certain number, about 256 can be registered at the same time. Versus in machine type communication, we are expecting very very large number of devices running into thousands even more than that which need to be connected at the same time. However, the traffic that they are going to be sending is going to be far lesser than what the humans are expected to be sending at the same time. The data rates that they require are far lower. For example, for a meter the data rates in the range of kilobits per second which are laughable for our communication type is are allowed. One more important thing is that there is far more focus on uplink communication than on downlink communication. Most of the meters or these things are sending the data to the gateway. They will be receiving some amount of data, for example, some updates or some changes in the mechanism that may be received, but most of the things are sent up versus for our communication, although we are uploading data, most of our communication is still in the downlink direction. And generally, they are expected to be much more inexpensive, far cheaper. The earlier communication systems, even up to 4G, whenever the systems were designed, the focus was always on how do I get the fastest communication system? How do I make the quality of service better? In the sense that I could be in a train which is going at 200 kilometers per hour, I still want seamless connectivity. I want data rates up to 1 gigabits per second. So the focus was purely only on that. So we are trying to improve the spectral efficiency. We are trying to get the highest, fastest data as possible. However, in 5G, it was recognized that 
the newer development, the, the latest generation will be driven by two of these emerging use cases. We are still extremely data hungry or bandwidth hungry, but there is another class which is now we are, what we are talking about the devices that come under Internet of Things, Internet of Everything, Industry 4.0, Spartex. These are all the devices which are also going to need communication and their requirements are going to be far different than the devices that prefer extreme mobile uh, broadband where we want high data rate, high mobility, everything has to be top of the line versus here the requirements are going to be different. How different are they going to be? Again, all machine type communications requiring devices are not the same. They are going to be very, very different and we have classified, they have been classified into two different classes. Massive ML MTC, massive uh, machine type communication and second one is what is referred to as the ultra reliable machine type communication. So when you are talking about Internet of Things, within that, whether I am talking about a smart home or intelligent uh, transportation system, each one will add new scenario with different assumptions, different type of requirements. For example, if I am talking about long term environmental observation, whether I am talking about looking at following how many tigers are still around or who is, how, who is poaching, in those cases energy consumption becomes a big issue. If I am talking about smart cities with millions and millions of sensors all over, large amount of data, large number of sensors, that becomes an issue. If we are talking about completely wireless factories where machines are doing all the work, in that case, the latency, how much time does it take for the data to reach such that a decision is made and the decision is sent back, that becomes the issue. One of the things you can consider in that is also the self-driven car. In that case, latency and reliability is the highest issue. For our work right now, it's the massive MTC which is the of interest for us right now. So, talking a little bit more about MTC, it is about providing wireless connectivity to tens and billions. Again, I don't even know how many zeros there are going to be because everybody says by 2025 there are going to be so many billions of IoT devices, how many there are going, are going to be, I don't know. Let's just say there are going to be a large number. Generally, the idea is that they are low complexity, they are low power and generally we expect them to be relatively inexpensive or cheap devices because there are going to be just a large number of them. So the focus is not on the high peak rate. I am no longer talking about gigabits kind of a connectivity. I want scalable connectivity so that I can connect large number of devices. I have so many sensors now along the road for intelligent traffic systems. I may want to add 100 more, 1000 more. I should, the system should be scalable. One more thing is, remember the word coverage here, I would like a better coverage. By coverage I mean some of the sensors might be in the basement. Wherever they are, they should be able to connect to the network to the same 5G network that everybody else is connecting. The typical example of MMTC is the collection of measurements from massive number of sensors, again such as, as I said, smart metering. Just for completion, let me talk quickly about UMTC also. Uh, UMTC is about providing adequate wireless links for network services with stringent requirements. This is something where a large amount of work is being done right now in 5G, especially for latency. In NCL lab, we are doing a little work on that, but not a whole lot. But as I said, important part here is the latency, how quickly can the service turn around occur. And one of the applications is, of course, the smart cars and any of the other applications such as medical uh, or the healthcare operations where there may be some surgeries which are being done or also in any of the factories. Okay. So that was all about machine type communication. So we said that machine type communication is important. We are going to have a large number of devices which will need access to the network and many times at the same time. We don't want them to be expensive. We don't want them to consume too much power and they are going to be large in number. That is our problem here. So when this requirement came into picture, when the study was done by 3GPP, they, re they realized that several enhancements need to be done to the existing cellular systems. 
uh, whenever IoT devices are connected to the network, one way to connect them is say indirectly, say via our Wi-Fi network or using Bluetooth. But whenever you are talking about devices such as meters or even for the intelligent transportation systems, Cellular communication is preferred because it is well established, it is omnipresent and also the security features are far, far better for the cellular systems versus connecting it to any Wi-Fi that is available. So several invest, uh, uh, enhancements are required uh, as it was prepared, looked at it. One of the major requirements that was identified was the coverage enhancement and that's the one that we are looking at here. The motivation again is that there are poor radio condition in some deployment scenarios and some of the things like the meters they are always going to be in the basement so they are always going to be suffering with the low, no, uh, low signal to noise ratio condition. So what do we do in those cases? How can we allow these uh, devices to be able to connect to the network without incurring any other additional cost? So how do we improve the coverage? Just talking very, very briefly about it, whenever we say there is no coverage, essentially that means the signal strength that we are receiving is weaker compared to the noise level that is present. As you all of you already know, it's not the, just the signal level that matters, it's always with respect to the noise. Can I differentiate the signal from the noise? If that is true, I should be able to get the connectivity. So when I say I want to increase, enhance the coverage, what I'm saying is I would like to increase the SNR that is seen by these IoT devices. How do I increase the SNR? SNR is the ratio of signal to noise, right? So there are probably only two things to do. Either increase the signal or reduce the noise. Well, it's not as simple as that. There are a few things that we can do more than that. We could increase the transmit power, as I said, which is never ever an option. Nobody who is designing the system would like to do that. For one, there are stringent requirements on how much transmit power that can be used and you cannot go beyond that. You could have improved hardware such that your noise floor goes down. If your noise floor has gone down, even if the signal is poorer, you will have higher SNR. Improved hardware, as we know, is extremely expensive and remember our devices are the cheap ones. We don't want to increase the cost. You could have additional base stations, relay networks, again, which is an expensive option. Same is true with using the directional antenna. One of the options which has been used in practice is using the so-called channel coding to increase the coding gain or the SNR. Again, there are a couple of things I'm going to talk about here. When you say coding gain, your, the actual the signal power, uh, neither the signal power nor the noise power is changing. But we are going to do some coding, we are going to add some repetition so that our errors are reduced and it looks like our SNR has improved and which will allow us to get better connectivity. So to, before I go in more into how, what we are going to do with that, very quickly I am going to talk about what is this coding gain all about. So the additional channel codes can be used and channel codes are ubiquitous, they are part of all our communication systems and these are channel codes are the ones that allow us to receive these images from Saturn. When you are getting the infant data from the Saturn, if you think about the distance it is traveling, the signal to noise ratio is in terms of sometimes even in terms of minus 100, minus 200 dBm. Doesn't matter, we are still able to get the data purely because of the very, very powerful channel codes that were used. Uh, generally, channel codes, these are software-based solutions. They are adaptable depending upon the requirement. You can do that. You can provide significant SNR gains. And however, they require some modification at the transmitter and the receiver. And the proposed approach that I'll tell you about, we are doing something that can be done only at the receiver and without having to use any extra bit. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Uh, but generally the processing delay nowadays is quite minimized. Absolutely, that's where I'm going now. <laughs> so how much information can we send? 
Just going quickly to the so-called channel Hartley theorem, which is the basis of all modern communication, also referred to as the noisy channel coding theorem. It tells you how much information can I send over a noisy channel. Remember, this is an ideal case. This talks about so-called AWGN channel, where the only thing which is stopping me from communication is noise. Generally, in the existing communication systems, there are far other things. You have interference, you have multipath, there are a lot of other things. This is the ideal case. So the channel capacity, which is in bits per second, depends upon the bandwidth that is allocated to you, which is in hertz. We are all familiar with bandwidth. For our wireless LAN, Wi-Fi, the bandwidth for each channel is 20 megahertz. And it's the uh, ratio of signal to noise ratio, which determines the two things. Put together, the channel capacity is going to vary. It is possible to get infinite channel capacity, for example, as the noise tends towards zero, your SNR will tend towards infinity. And for a very, very small bandwidth, you could get, potentially, you could get infinite channel capacity. Think of it as the perpetual motion kind of a thing. So this is one of the most important things in digital communication. If you think about it, there are two factors here. Bandwidth and signal to noise ratio. If I have a lot of bandwidth available and low SNR, I can give away my bandwidth and gain SNR from that and improve my communication. If I have low bandwidth, but if my SNR is high, I could do the exchange other way. And that's what is done in all the modern communication systems. How is it done? I'll just try to explain that, okay? So the bandwidth limits how fast the information symbols can be sent over a given channel. Let me give you a simple example. If my bandwidth is 1 megahertz, that means my signal level can change as fast as 1 million times in 1 second. If the signal levels change faster than that, I can't detect those changes at the other end. If it changes slower than that, no problem. I am in a good shape. But it cannot change faster than 1 million times in one second because my bandwidth was one megahertz. How does SNR change in that? For example, if my signal levels are two, I have two levels. One is minus one, other is plus one. So I can say minus one represents bit zero, plus one represents bit one. So every time the signal level changes, the information I get is worth one bit. I could say that instead of having only two levels, minus one and plus one, I have four levels now. Minus one, minus one third, plus one third, and plus one. Now, every time the signal level changes, instead of getting one bit worth of information, I'll get two bits worth of information. What do I give away in that? Now, remember, my chances of my making error are far higher now. So, if my SNR is high, I could do that and I could get higher data rates. So, the SNR ratio will limit how much information that can be sent over each transmitted symbol. Increased SNR will make it more robust against the noise. They're so just quick examples. For the same bandwidth, when your SNR changes, now in the first case, every time my signal level is changing, it is still change, can change only max up to 1 million times per second, but the information I get for every change in signal level is worth 6.658 bits. Versus in the last case, where my signal is one-tenth of the noise, Remember, SNR is minus 10 dB. Every time my signal level changes, the information I get is worth only one-tenth of a bit because my SNR is much lower. So generally, the systems are classified as bandwidth limited or SNR limited. So for example, when we talk about satellite communication, these are the SNR limited uh, signals because in the satellite this thing or when I'm communicating uh, to, to Mars or to my satellites which are gone all the way to Saturn, my bandwidth I can use as much as I desire, but my signal levels are going to be incredibly less because of the distance that they need to travel. Versus when we talk about commercial systems, our bandwidth is limited. We are allowed to increase SNR, but our bandwidth is always going to be limited. So generally, so bandwidth determines the number of independent transitions and the SNR will determine the reliability which is measured in terms of probability of error. How often am I going to make errors? 
So this is my one graph here. Bear with me here, okay? So what am I talking about here? My title says probability of error and my graph here on the x-axis, it has something called EB over N0. I'm going to refer to it as SNR. If the students did that in class, I give them a hard time about it. But right now, let's just go with that. SNR and EB over N0 ratio, they are cousins, they're related. Just go with that. Similarly, probability of error is the probabilistic measure and BER is what is actually measured. So they are also related. So let's go with that. So if you see here, the blue line shows 4QM. Don't worry about what that QM is. 4QM means with every transition, there are four transitions possible. So every transition gives me information worth two bits. In the second one, for 16QM, every transition gives me information worth four bit. So if I use 16 QAM, my overall capacity will be double. I can send, instead of sending two megabits per second, I can send four megabits per second. What do I lose here? If I scan the graph this way, to get the same probability of error, I have to have higher signal to noise ratio here. Or if you traverse the graph vertically like this, at the same EB over N0 or SNR ratio, my probability of error is going to increase. So this is an example where we gave away our SNR and got the bandwidth back. When I used my 16 QAM instead of 4 QAM, my overall capacity doubled, which is equivalent of getting double the bandwidth. What is the price that I pay? My probability of error went up, which is equivalent to my SNR going down. So this is an example of I gave away my SNR and got bandwidth back. In the reality, nothing has changed on this thing, okay? But this is the perception. So if the system is bandwidth limited, which is our traditional systems, more bits are allocated per symbol, increasing the overall bits per second without any additional bandwidth. So now the price that I'm paying is higher probability of error, which is equivalent to seemingly lower SNR. Versus when the system is SNR limited, when I have lower SNR, which is the case that I'm going to be talking about, I can give, allocate smaller number of bits per symbol, allowing the system to overall reduce the probability of error. Reduced probability of error is equivalent to increasing my SNR. The price I pay for it is going to be my bandwidth utilization will go down. So although actual bandwidth is B, it may seem like I have bandwidth is only B divided by 10, for example. So this is my another graph, then I'll straight go to this thing. So this is generally what is seen as coding gain. <coughs> and Ashley Nath was asking, what is the limit to that? Generally, uh, there is a limitation to that. You can go as low as an EB over N0 ratio of minus 1.6 dB. That's the Nyquist limit. But the newer and newer coders that we are coming up with are increasing the coding gain more and more. So in this case, this is the graph for no coding and this is the one with the coding. So when I do the coding, what happens is at the same SNR, my probability of error is going to be lower, which is now if my probability of error is lower, which is equivalent to higher SNR, and now my device can connect to the network, although the actual SNR is lower. So, yeah. more and additional bits. There are several uh, extremely detailed techniques. So, but basic idea is I have redundancy to the system. I add redundancy and more than that, I add structure to the system. So I say that only such a sequence is possible. For example, one zero can only be followed by zero one. If I get one zero followed by zero zero, I know error has occurred. I can do something to correct. So there is, but nothing can be done without adding redundancy. So the example that I always give first is consider our simple repetition three coding, right? I'm going to send the same bit three times. So my detection is easy. If I get zero three times, I know you're transmitted zero. If I get zero two times, I'm going to say you transmitted zero. If, and that way I can correct one bit error. So I improve my error correction, with, so my probability of error will go down, my operating SNR increases, but my bandwidth went down by a factor of 3. 
that is the simplest coding but believe it or not in the earlier communication system wired communication system that's what was used some of the earliest at&t modems used the repetition coding because the decoders were easy generally the coders are classified into two types this is the broad classification the block codes and the convolutional codes all modern communication systems use combinations of those one code doesn't work you have to use combination of them to make the systems work for example the hamming codes bch codes these are the binary codes which were used reed solomon code which is a byte word code which has been used in all our storage media wmax xdsl ldpc and polar codes are the entrants for the 5g standard one will be used for control channel one for data the convolutional coders which is what i am going to be looking at have been extremely popular uh, with the viterbi coders have been used for gsm wcdma and also for lte and another version of uh, uh, convolutional coders which are called the turbo codes which were first used to receive the data from mars they have been used in lte also so convolutional codes are kind of complicated they map the information in terms of the bit sequentially as i said depending upon the structure only certain sequences are allowed if that sequence is not received we know an error has occurred and because we know what the sequence is supposed to be we can correct some of the errors so this is from an old paper by andrew witterby uh this is paper which was i think 1967 i like to use this diagram the convolutional coders were known to people in many many years back right from 1960s however the point everybody also knew that they were extremely powerful but they were not used the problem was like what our abhimanyu had people knew how to encode it people didn't know how to decode it easily the using the computers that were available at that time decoding wasn't quite working out well andrew witterby proposed a technique that's the one that has been used even now it's called the witterby decoder and witterby's algorithm has been used successfully for decoding this convolutional codes and that's what we have used in our this one also so this is a simple coder what happens here is depending upon the bit sequence don't worry about this thing only certain output sequences are allowed for example in this case there are two bits that are output so 0 0 can only be followed by 1 1 if 0 0 is followed by 0 1 or 1 0 we know there is an error every time i show the picture people are always worry this is the trellis what we are saying here is that remember the system can be in one of the four states and depending upon what the input is there are only certain paths that can be followed now any time the uh, received signal has a different path i have i am going to use the principle of nearest neighbor i am going to say that this is allowed this is allowed what i receive is somewhere else i find the one which is closest to it and i am going to use that that's my decision so in this case now you see those states there are about four states here because the memory of this particular coder is a two you increase the memory the moment the registers become three the states go to they increase exponentially it's going to be 2 to the power 3 and in <coughs> as we'll see in lte we use the seven state one so the number of states are 2 to the power 7 or 128 and with each one of them there are going to be different paths that are present and depending upon which your path is the closest we make the decision the more the memory the more powerful the uh, decoder becomes so for uh, decoding the convolutional codes witterby algorithm is almost universally used in most of our systems and it's also the implementation can be easily parallelized so most of the times it is implemented by using hardware it pro and also provides the maximum likelihood performance all of you know maximum likelihood that means we can't do better than that that's the optimum output the performance and complexity increases exponentially with the constraint length and decoding becomes complicated some ways people have tried to reduce the complexity by saying that 
I am going to remove the sum of the parts and say that those are not available. Every time we do that, uh, the, the optimum decoder becomes suboptimum one. What we have done in our work, we said that, look, there are certain bits that are already known to us at the receiver. If we use those bits, some of the paths can be taken away. So now my performance will improve. The uh, complexity is going to decrease and my overall SNR gain is going to improve. So what are these known bits? Why didn't anybody use that? The people have thought about it. The idea here is that in all the standardized communication systems, there, is, there are certain bit fields and parameters which have been left for later changes, any additions that have to be done. So these bits are generally referred to as the spare bits. We are calling that the a priori known bits. So now since those bits are known, we don't need to decode them. We use them in the coder to improve the accuracy. <coughs> when these contiguous bits are known, the trail is suddenly become, instead of becoming one long path, it reduces to two short paths. And our odds of making error in two short paths are lesser than us making error in the one long path. So these pre-known bits generally we classified into two types. In category 1 and category 2. Category 1 is the reserve or the spared bit. There, are, uh, there is a reason why I split them into two. For example, LT is still, believe it or not, relatively new technology. There are some bits that are left as spare because some addition, some improvement will be done. Versus in GSM or 3G, no more uh, improvements are planned, so there are no uh, spare bits left in that. The second set of bits that are deterministic, once the connection is made, the same bits are transferred across those bits. So I know what those bits are. I can use that to improve. These two bits may exist in the control and data messages in the standards, the reserve bits that are meant for future use most of the times remain unused and that's the one that we have used in this work. And the category 2 bits, generally it is what is called the cell timing. Once the device gets into a particular cell, it camps to that cell. After it has camped there, it gets the uh, cell timing in initially. So first when you are getting the cell timing, you don't know what those cells are because that information is unknown. But after that, the same information is repeated by the base station. So you are getting the same information and again and again and you can use that. So generally, initial acquisition, you can only use category 1 and later you can use the both category 1 and 2. And remember, whenever a device attaches itself to a cell, it always attaches to the cell that has the highest power. However, later when the signal power comes down, you can use these conditionally known bits to improve your signal to noise ratio. Very, very quickly, uh, we have looked at three use cases for MTC. All these three are looked at, especially GSM is looked at a lot more now because GSM infrastructure is already in place and the data rates are lower. Since the users are not using it, it could be easily used for machine type communication. So for LTE, uh, they, we have in each one of them, we have considered the special control channels. These are all physical channels. So in LTE, there are 10 bits which are reserved and which have been set to zero. So there is no decision needs to be made about it. Those bits are zero and those are used. In GSM and uh, WCDMA, which WCDMA is used in 3G, there are no excess bits. However, some bits can be conditionally determined. And if you look at the Viterbi decoder here, in this, all three of them use convolutional coder and the matching Viterbi decoder. In this case, the memory of this is uh, 9. That means the total number, the states of the system are going to be 2 to the power 8 or 256 states. It's a large decoder. So this is the general configuration for these is for the specific channel. For LTE, we have used the PBCH. Again, these are all control channels. And generally, it's most important that the devices get the control signals. Even if the data signal takes some time, the connection won't be dropped. But if the control signals are not received, it's a problem. So each one of them, these are the different encoder configuration. And these are the number of bits that are known at the receiver. 
again since it is this thing since it was a paper i had to give you a very little bit of math not much i'm just going to tell you why how do we prove that the error actually reduces uh generally for all analysis we use a much simpler coder i'll tell you what this terminology means that means for every one input bit we generate two output bits and the number 3 there means to generate those two output bits i use one of the current bit and two of the bits from the past so for example here for lte for every one input bit i'm generating three output bits and i am using the six output bits six input bits from the past that's the memory so generally when you talk about how well the coder works we use a terminology called the free distance so for this coder the free distance is 5 that means it can correct up to two bit errors at the same time but the thing with convolutional coders what we are saying is that now if there are more than five errors i may confuse between two paths and identify them as the same so there is going to be only one path which is five distance away from my path there are going to be two paths which are six distance away four paths which are seven distance away and two to the power k paths that are going to be k plus five distance away so the longer my trail is becomes the chances of my making error becomes higher and higher so we there is a term which is defined as the first event error probability so which is the error that i am making the error in the first time that the correct path is excluded for the first time and as you can notice in this term here again this phi is refers to the uh, free distance but if you notice here this exponent of l plus 1 as the length of the path increases my probability of error is going to increase so what we have done is that we know certain number of bits they are not going to be contiguous <coughs> some of them are located at the beginning some of them at the end some of them at the beginning in the middle i'm sorry so what we have showed that doesn't matter whether the bits are at the beginning end or at the middle in any case the probability of error whenever i have known bits is always going to be less than the probability of error when none of the bits are known so we considered one case where the known bits are at the beginning or at the end in that case the length of the trail is decreases because of which the probability of error will be reduced if the contig the known bits are in the middle then the trail is broken into two parts and as i said without the math the smaller the length of the path the lesser are the chances that we are going to get lost in it and making error so we have proved that so long as the number of known bits is greater than 1 will always do better than what it would have been if there were no bits were known to us and of course some graphs for you just a couple of them so here we are talking about the bit error rate versus snr this is for the lte coding and the outermost one is where we are we don't have any of the known bits just using the traditional bitter bit decoder the middle one is where we are using only the category 1 bit and the in the inside one is where we are using both the types of known bits in any channel coders generally we are trying to always move more and more inside towards this that shows your improvement so in this case as you can see at low snr i have significant gain which is always the case because at low snr when their errors are likely to be made and your scope for improvement as the snr starts improving i am doing well anyway so even without any help i would be able to get the kind of gain and that was the expected performance the gain here can range uh, for lte we have the best results this is for gsm where we don't have any of the category 1 bit so the improvement is lesser and the improvement was even lower for cdma because in that case the bit size with the frame size is too large compared to that the number of known bits were too small uh 3 gpp is required the coverage enhancement for coverage enhancement the coding gain should be about 20 dp using our technique we are able to get maximum up to 5 dp but 
again it is not expected that one single technique will be able to give you a 20 db kind of gain it is expected to be combination of several things which will allow us to improve the coverage for many of these smaller devices so quickly a summary uh, the cellular communication is becoming a preferred mode for communication for many iot systems the obviously it's not the only mode many of the devices will still be connecting as i said whether by using uh, wifi or by bluetooth and then wifi zigbee many of these different ones but the cellular iot is really picking up a large part of it because of the security and as well as deep penetration of most of these cellular communication system for massive machine type communication coverage enhancement is necessary we have to be able to improve the snr levels again coverage enhancement without installing any extra hardware or without increasing any power due to large number of these devices it's necessary that the solution must be cost effective most of the rather all of the standardized communication systems will have spare or unused bits that are reserved for future applications and these bits can be used to improve the performance of the system this proposed technique can also be looked at as a cross layer optimization technique because here what we are doing is that the context information which is available in the layer 1 controller is given to the physical layer and that's the way the both the layers are working together here in this case we have applied it only for bitter bd coder in other channel coders also it should be applicable uh, because generally any time you know the bit you are uh, overall your this thing is reduced uncertainty is reduced the reduced uncertainty means that we should be able to do better and uh, in our other work we have also used these same bits for using doing something called constellation constraining that is yet another thing but that is far more purely into physical layer and the results were similar the performance gain performance gain wasn't any extra additional compared to the reduced bit b but the same knowledge could be used in variety of different ways but as you can imagine the same knowledge can be cannot be used twice and get expect to get twice the gain you can either use it for constellation constraining or you could use it in the channel coder so that's it thank you what is the kind of challenge to the interference there huh? uh inter again you know harmonics that won't be a problem because they're still going to use our traditional communication system the problem more will be in terms of how many of them will we allow them to connect at the same time so that is more of the maclear issue because uh-huh. at the maclear they may be trying to connect it. connect exactly so there is a lot of work which is being done because what happens is most of these devices they also have what is called periodic communication so i might just be sending the one is the heartbeat signal and second when i keep sending my readings every so many times so if all of them try to connect at the same time we are going to have a problem so there is some different work which is being done on and they're being done on that but uh, as such here we are not talking about increasing the capacity what we are saying is that small number of devices large bandwidth instead we want to have large number of devices with lower data rate how can we do that kind of opposite of what we have been going up to till 4g where we said we want more and more and more bandwidth so the you said uh, most of the changes are on the software which part of the whole infrastructure that software the decoder everything so generally what happens is the we uh, most of them we try to limit the hardware as much as possible that's the most expensive part so we have the so called analog front end so you receive the signal the initial this thing is uh, done uh, demodulation after that all the processing is done on the software so typically we find that whenever we introduce a software component between so they do contribute to latency and absolutely yeah generally see in this case it won't add any additional latency because every time when you are trying to decode there will be some amount of latency associated but that is taken into account and since now all our uh, processors are fast enough the computational this thing it doesn't take time 
having said that uh, when when we are talking about ldpc for 5g those are massive block sizes so latency is one of the issues there and the second one when i talked about the turbo codes which were used they are kind of iterative codes so i have one coder here one here the output of this feeds back here and feeds back there and they continue to do that and sometimes they never converge so those were used uh, but with to great success when we are getting those images from uh, mars rover so sometimes you won't get it but whenever you got you got great images Mm -hmm. right. Allocating. Hmm. Yeah, but that will be you know you, that will be a smaller update at the receiver end. That's it. Huh? At the whenever the any but generally generally for the LTE whenever they change that they will in uh, roll out a new release. so every time a new release is rolled out generally all these devices need to get that update even including our phones whenever the release comes we have to yeah yeah so the downlink actually that's one of the things how do i get the software upgrade software upgrades to that hmm Hmm. Then maybe you can use that to improve uh, the performance. Hmm. What happens when you don't know the signal? Okay. There are two things. When I say redundancy, now one way that is your pure ch channel code. When I talked about repeating the same thing thrice. So in that case, if I am sending bit one, I am I am expecting to receive one one one. Instead of I get one one zero, I assume that this bit is at an error, and I correct it. that is one way of correcting of course it's entirely possible that two bits are at an error then i make a wrong decision but the newer coders generally they are extremely powerful and they are designed so that the probability of error is as low as 10 to the power minus 12 so it is that rare for an error to escape through the channel decoder now here we are talking about in addition to this i know some bit so that although when you are sending it to me I already know what they are, so I don't need to try to correct them. So in that trellis, I don't need to go around. I say that it has to come here, and now correct all the paths. These bits are known, and now start a new path. So when I know something, the unknown path length has become smaller, and that will allow me to reduce my probability of error. Uh huh. but that's always the you know that's always the trade off you know because uh, see and in general in communication systems we do one more thing which are called source coders so when they are sending the speech we compress the speech when we do that we remove the redundancy now and then we introduce now controlled redundancy so that we can use it at the other end so that's the reason when we speak even if part of the speech is taken out there is enough redundancy in our speech we can figure out what has happened but if we remove that any error will affect it so now we introduce controlled redundancy and how better you do that allah will allow you to yeah. loudly i i don't hear very well hmm Mhm. Okay. The hardware gain can be extremely high because you know what happens is remember we talked about something called noise floor. That's the noise which is environmental noise and most of it is the thermal noise which is generated by the device itself. so this is my floor if you can bring it down you can get as much as minus 20 db you see in it you have cheap uh, mobile phones and you have an iphone the difference can be substantial you can get 20 db even higher mm -hmm. the cost difference is very high 
generally anything to do with hardware whenever you want to improve it the cost generally is quite high i am not sure how much it i am i'll still go with the me phone and the iphone <laughs> 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 trellis yeah trellis no 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 see there is nothing about learning about the trellis the trellis path is given the trellis path uh, it depends upon the kind of uh, coder that you have used ha huh. so for each coder there will be a corresponding viterbi decoder and that corresponding viterbi decoder and depending upon and it's like you know convolutional coders they are very powerful in the sense that for the same 2 comma 1 for one input bit i have two output bits but if my memory is i'm using is only three memory elements uh my coding gain is say 5 db i can use nine uh, elements my coding gain increases suddenly to 9 db a uh, 7 db or 9 db so your complexity increases exponentially but you can <coughs> uh-huh so one example of where we didn't see this in social media uh, there's a paper audit trail that this uh, voting right so uh, especially where the need to uh, account for errors and so on uh, increasing the resistance actually absolutely i still keep telling these people when i first uh, when i was in penstate i joined as a ta we used to have one credit course for how to teach one of the things she taught us was that your best student is paying at this best student paying attention 50% of the time so you must repeat everything at least twice but repeating twice doesn't help for example if i send the bit one twice at the other end i don't know which time i made a mistake so i have to do something different and of course if i keep saying same thing twice students are going to think i'm going nuts so one thing is for example you know in inductor the current leaves the voltage sorry current lacks the voltage by 90 degrees that also means that the voltage leaves the current by 90 degrees somebody will hear one of the two and something will go in our time diversity <laughs> thank you any other question thank you very much